And, and if you are from a churched background, you're probably thinking, oh no, Malachi 3. Is he going to pass the offering plate again? No, okay, no. We just took the offering, the one and only offering. And in fact, today's sermon is not about the money portion of Malachi 3, if you're familiar, because that's what you hear. When you hear a sermon on Malachi 3, you hear it preached in the context of tithing and bringing your offerings to the Lord. But there's more, and I'm going to give you that more today. Now, how many of you on the Discovery Channel have ever seen the show um, called Gold Rush? Anybody ever watch that? Yeah, some of you, absolutely, some of you. You know, I, I like the show, and I've, I've watched it, but I'm surprised. They're like seven seasons in now, right? I mean, we followed the Hoffman clan from absolute utter failure and, and their early on struggles, and then they went to South America and really failed, and now I think they're in Oregon, right? They're, they're mining in Oregon again. Um, or, or yeah, Oregon or Oregon if you're not from there, but it's Oregon if you live there. Um, so they're in Oregon uh, mining, and, and it's this really interesting show, and, and it appeals to me at the very least, I know, because it's a pretty blue-collar show, frankly, right? Um, they occasionally have to use the beep button. Well, not even occasionally. If Tony is talking, it's a lot, right? If you've listened, Tony... Is this colorful guy? He's kind of a Viking warrior kind of guy, big, burly, hairy, gruff kind of guy, and his language reflects that. But I'm drawn to the show because it, it's got this kind of roughneck, blue-collar people in it. They're hardworking. They're the kind of people that I find in my family, actually. Uh, the kind of people where when you go to shake the man's hand, you know this is a guy who works with his hands for a living. They're rough. They're calloused, right? And, and so I, I relate to that, even though my family's never mined anything as far as I know, but that, that hard working, that salt of the earth, that, that, that rough, you know, farmer or industrial worker or welder, or, I, I got a lot of that in my background. And, and so I, I enjoy that show quite a bit. And, and the other reason that I enjoy the show, and, and this might seem like a, a really random reason, I guess, to you, but the other reason I really like the show is because when they find the gold, right, they do all this music. The music swells, you know, they're creating atmosphere. We found the gold, right? But what does that gold look like? It's like these little tiny flecks amongst a bunch of dirt and mud. It doesn't really look all that impressive. It is, it is not really all that exciting. It's not like when the music builds up and swells, you think, oh, there's a giant 10-pound nugget, but no. They found like four flakes in a pan the size of a skillet, right? And, and I kind of like that about it because cause they're like, we found it. You know, we're going to make an ounce every hour, or, you know, an ounce every thousand yards of dirt, which is an ounce for a thousand yards of dirt is, is mind-blowing how much dirt they move to find just a little bit of gold. And, and, and when you see them doing that, you, you almost feel like, I mean, I grew up in South Dakota where you could literally go out to the Black Hills with a pan and actually still find gold today. But when I see this, I mean, I want to start go digging through my backyard in Aiken and thinking if I get down deep enough, I might find some pay dirt, right? It doesn't take that much to make some money. I don't know. I got a little stream there. I could work. What do you think? Could I, could I start the Aiken gold mine? Get, get some tourists to come through and pan my backyard? I never know. I'm not going to, though. But uh, I like the way my backyard looks. We're not digging it up. But the thing is in the story here, they see the beauty where most people just see a dirty rock, Right? I mean, they see real value of the gold that is embedded in the rest of the impurities. Now, I'm just using that as an illustration because at least 12 different times in Scripture, God is referred to as the refining fire, right? They have to take all those little bits and tiny pieces of gold and put it together and refine it to make something out of it, right? That's, that's how that system works. And our God and his relationship with us, it is one of refinement. And as we're in this season of Advent thinking about the coming of Jesus Christ, as we think about the initiating love of God towards us as sinners, as we think about God reaching in to save us, 
What we see in that initiating love of God is, is that he's not just interested only in saving us, but he's interested in saving us and transforming us, pulling out the beauty in us that oftentimes we and others may struggle to see in ourselves, right? Kind of like that gold in the dirt. Now, the Bible is very clear that God sees us as incredibly valuable, folks. God never sees you as cheap. The very blood of his son is the price that he paid for you, not a price that's cheaply paid. Blood shed for you. And so God puts on flesh. That's what we talk about here in this Advent season, that God taking on flesh, God coming to earth, Emmanuel, God dwelling with us in this Christmas season. Advent is about God initiating not only just your your ransom and your rescue, but he's also purifying us, purifying our lives, making us more Christ-like for our joy and for his glory. Now we see in the book of Malachi, God is pleading with his people for more. And that's where we hear often in the context of finances, the sermon preached. So God is pleading with his people for more here in the book of Malachi, and he's forecasting in it the coming of Jesus. And then he's explaining what happens when Jesus will come. So let's look at this. If you're following along, Malachi 3, starting in verse 1. And there it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Right? Does that sound like anything else you've heard somewhere else? Right? That's a reference to John the Baptist, the one who is to come, right? New Testament. And then it says, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And I'll stop there just for a second. Because that's the Christmas story, isn't it? God is going to send one who's going to be proclaiming the one who is to come, and then the one who is to come is going to come. Malachi, 300-ish years before the time of Jesus. We find in Malachi, the book that's right next to Matthew, the Christmas story. You ever noticed it there before? There it is. And it says, John the Baptist is coming to prepare a way. That finally, finally, right? If, If you were a Jew at this time, you're like, finally, Lord. The one, was, the, one, the one who's so long been promised, the one we've been looking for for generation after generation after generation, finally you're sending him, right? That's what the Jews were feeling. Finally, Christ is going to come. Finally, Christ is going to be here. You see, the people of Israel, they have been looking for a Savior, They've been oppressed at this time, right? They've recently been put into exile. They've just recently come out of that exile. The walls of the city have finally been rebuilt. The temple, once again, has finally been reestablished. They're longing, they're yearning for their enemies to be vanquished, their enemies to be pushed away, their enemies to be gone so that they can establish a kingdom among themselves. That's what they were looking for. That's where their hopes were. And here he says, he's coming. It's coming. But then, if you're following along in the passage there, it takes a turn. Kind of a, well, I wouldn't say a strange turn, but a turn that we're going to spend some time looking at today. Verse 2. So it says, he is coming to proclaim the one who is coming will come, the one you've been looking for. And then it says, but then who can endure the day of his coming? Who then can stand when he appears? You're paying attention. That kind of took a bit of an ominous turn there, didn't it? Not really where you were thinking this was going to go. Then it says, the object of your delight is on on his way. The covenant is going to be fulfilled. Your enemies will be vanquished. The kingdom will be established. But who can stand at his coming? 
who can endure when he arrives? And it continues on. It says, for he is like a refiner's fire, right? Like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner of pure, a refiner and purifier of silver and gold. He's going to refine, get rid of the dross, get rid of the excess, and then they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem, which if you don't know what that means, that's just generally a reference there to the people of God. So then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the day of old, as in the former years. Then, he says, I will draw near to you for judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages and the widow and the, follower and the fatherless and against those who thrust aside the sojourner, which is the immigrant. And then he says, do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. And if we go to verse 6, we get something that's just huge in this. And in fact, if you write in your Bibles and you got your own Bible along, verse 6 is one to underline or highlight or make a note of. Um, if you got an iPad, don't write on it. <laughs> I'm not cleaning it for you. That's not my fault. But verse 6 is huge. It says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. So my sermon today has literally just, just one key point. One key point, that's it. That doesn't mean it's going to be any shorter today, but there's just one key point. Are you ready? The key point is God is at work in the mess. Okay? That's it. That's my point. God is at work in the mess. And let me show you what I mean here. Look at that uh, second part of verse 2, and we'll work our way through this. For he, the coming Christ, is like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi, the, the priests of the time, and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. And then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem, again, the people of God, will be pleasing to the Lord as it was in the days of old, as it was in the former years. The, the people here in, in the book of Malachi, they've just recently been freed from Babylonian captivity. Right? One of the things God does throughout the Old Testament is when his people are disobedient, when his people aren't following him, when his people aren't paying attention to the things that he's instructed them in, what does God do to get their attention? Well, Frequently, he uses a neighboring nation to come in and conquer them. And in some cases, not only do they get conquered, but they get taken away in captivity. Nebuchadnezzar, right? Takes him. Takes him to another place. Takes him hundreds, 700 miles away from Jerusalem. I mean, that in itself is a bad deal, but when you're a Jew, if you're 700 miles from the temple, how do you worship? How do you bring your offerings? What do you do? So being taken into captivity, that's a big, big deal. That is God really trying to get your attention. But now as we get to the book of Malachi, they're free. They've been freed from slavery. Jerusalem, it's been reestablished. The temple, they've built it back up. Sacrifices have, have resumed in the temple. But the problem is they've kind of hit their stride and now they're becoming complacent. Everything's kind of going well for them, right? Everything's going good. Babylonians are gone. We got the city. We get to worship. Oh, yeah, they're on spiritual autopilot. But the problem is that's not what God is looking for. And they've grown complacent and cold towards the Lord. And so it's the rhythm of the people of God to, in their times of need, cry out to him. But then, when things are going well, they grow lax. 
and get nonchalant about their faith as God is helping them prosper. And you see that cycle again and again and again throughout the Old Testament. When I read the Old Testament, and I, and I do this in Bible studies and I talk with students and all kinds of things as I talk to people about it, you read this. I mean, this Old Testament makes up more of your Bible than the New Testament, right? It's a lot more pages. And when you read that, you look at those people in the Old Testament and you go, they were kind of dumb, weren't they? They didn't learn very quick, did they? Because they keep doing the same stupid thing over and over and over. God blesses them. They thrive. They start to ignore God. They start to worship other gods. They start to focus on themselves. They forget about God. God brings in his judgment. They suffer. God gets their attention. Eventually, they repent. And they pray, God, save us. What does God do? God saves them, brings them back. They thrive and they prosper. And you think at that point, you go, okay, we learned our lesson. Let's stick with this God. No. They're dumb. And they go back to their old sinful ways. And it starts over again. And it's easy for us to look back and to read the pages and go, man, they're stupid. Right? But that's a picture of us. So don't get too cocky. We're very much the same, aren't we? We think we've conquered that sin. We think we've moved beyond. Oh, glorious me. I'm doing so good. I sinned again. I failed. And then we come back. And we're doing great again. And we go off the rails over here. We are just like them. And in Malachi, God is really using this prophet Malachi. And he's using him to rebuke the people of God for being half-hearted. And the way that he goes about rebuking them here, it's really interesting, actually, I think, anyhow. Because he's rebuking them by appealing to them about the love of God. Now, as we dig through this, it might not immediately seem and sound like the love of God, but it is. When we talk about the love of God, our minds and our culture, we, we want to talk about the love of God and talk about the, kind of the, the soft love of God, right? We want to drift towards the delightful things, the, the blessing of God. When God is giving me everything I want, then I feel the love of God, right? How do you feel when God is refining you, though? How do you feel when God is rebuking you? How, how do you feel when God is disciplining you? Do you feel loved? Maybe not as much, huh? A conversation I have with my son when I have to discipline him. I'll, I'll make him sit on my leg, put my arm around him and say, buddy, I love you too much to let you do this. So we're going to change. And sometimes we have to have that conversation more than once. And we will keep having that conversation because I love him too much to leave him the way that he is, right? God loves you too much to leave you the way that you are. And if he's refining you and when he is refining you, because it's not a matter of if, that's him actually loving you. I mean, we like to think of how God loves us, how he forgives us. How he sings over us, you know. The prophet Zephaniah says he rejoices in us and he applauds us, right? And those things are absolutely, absolutely true. Yet, there's the flip side of that coin. There's more to that love. And so Malachi's appeal here is don't be half-hearted because God is going to refine you. He is jealous for you. Remember? God says, I will have no other gods. I am your God and you are my people and you will have no other gods before me. Period. I have no questions about that, people of Israel. He's jealous for you. He loves you. And as a loving father, he doesn't want harm to come to us. He doesn't want harm to come to them because of a nonchalant, half-hearted faith. And so Malachi comes, he, he's a prophet, and he says, hey folks, listen up. Our God is a refining fire, and he is going to burn away the impurities. He's going to wash away the unclean. Now lest you think this only happens in the book of Malachi, let me give you a couple other examples in scripture where this is talked about. James 1-2. 
James is the most practically applicable book of the whole Bible. I mean, you read James, you do James. James is like an instruction manual for faith. But James says this in James 1, 2. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Right? Count it as joy when you meet trials of various kinds? I love that word various, actually, right? That word various there is kind of like the, the theological junk drawer because just about everything can fit in it. You guys have a junk drawer in your kitchen? Anybody not have a junk drawer in their kitchen? Like, you know, those junk drawers, it's like when, when, when a kid comes up and it's like, where do I put this junk drawer, right? I, even if it has a home, you'll figure it out later. Just put it in the junk drawer. And, and you go in there and, and, and there's band-aids and there's masking tape and there's probably some scissors and there's probably string from a kite and, and some coupons probably. And what else do you got in your junk drawer? Pliers and... Spare batteries and like a newspaper article you meant to read three years ago, right? That's, that's a, it's a junk drawer. Some paper clips. Whenever somebody says, where do I put it? A junk drawer. And, and he's saying here, consider it all joy when you face trials of various kinds. Would that be sickness? That's various. Would it be financial? Well, that's various. Would it be relational? Yeah, yeah, that's various. It's going to fit into this various drawer. You name it, it fits into that drawer. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Why? Because then it continues on. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. I love this idea of testing of our faith. Because, you know what, God... God knows where our faith is at, right? So the testing of our faith is not so that God can figure out where we are at, so that God can figure out where we are standing, but instead the testing of our faith is to strengthen us, right? You go to the gym. You test your strength so that you can find out how strong you are how much you can move, how much you can lift, how much you can press. God already knows how strong we are. He's showing us something. And we consider it all joy when we face these trials because God is at work in them. And we need to know that if God is at work in it, then we have not been abandoned. We're not necessarily being punished. It's not the devil just trying to get us, right? But when we face trials, God is at work in it. There's still some impurities to, to be burned off of us. Things that are still needing to be done away with, cleaned off, right? Purified. And the truth of the matter is it's going to be that way until the day we die. We're always going to have something. Something that needs to be cleaned. <clears throat> Another verse where this is talked about in the New Testament, we find this in Romans 5.3. Romans 5.3 says it even more strongly, in fact. This idea of the refining fire. It says, not only that, but we have to rejoice, right? Rejoice in our sufferings, says the Apostle Paul. Rejoice. When the trials of life come, how many of you rejoice? Is that your first response? When that bad news comes at the hospital, when that phone call comes, when you look at the checking account and... There's just nothing left. Woohoo! Singing, dancing, praising, woohoo! Party rocking in the house tonight. Nobody else listens to pop music? Come on. But that's not our first response, is it? No, it's not. Like, that's a whole nother level Paul takes us to here. He says, Consider it joy when you face trials of various kinds. 
And then rejoice in your sufferings. I tell you what, that's hard for me. I mean, I know God is at work in the mess, but like, you know, rejoice? Really, God? Be glad in my sufferings? For that to happen, we're going to need the work of the Holy Spirit in us for that to come about. God has to be in it for us to be able to rejoice. But here's why we rejoice. It doesn't just end there. Here's why we rejoice. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts as through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Once again, if you want hope to grow, if you feel hopeless, if you feel weighed down, if you feel like you're in a spiritual desert, you feel spiritually dry, you feel sick, maybe even you feel abandoned, no, God is at work in the mess. And he's saying here that God is developing your endurance and that in endurance, hope will be more established. Think about endurance, right? Endurance is one of those things you have to generally work at to have, right? If you want to be a long-distance runner, you've got to put the time in. You've got to put the miles in. Most people have to go to the gym to be able to run longer or faster, right? But the crazy thing about living in our fallen Genesis 3 world is that you don't really have to go out of your way to develop this kind of spiritual endurance. You don't have to really seek it out. It will find you. God is at work in the mess. The mess of the world, the brokenness of the world brings ample opportunity for you to build some endurance, right? Most of us just don't get to float by in life where everything goes great and everything is grand and there's never a problem and there's never a worry. God brings opportunities right and left to us to grow in our endurance. And God is at work in that mess. He's refining. We're never given a promise that being a Christ follower will be easy. But it will be worth it. And when you're being refined, it, it can feel difficult at times. And it, it does actually, sometimes, if you're being refined, it might feel like, oh man, I think God has just abandoned me almost, right? When difficulty comes, the trials of life, we feel lost. God feels distant, doesn't he? We can even at times almost feel like, boy, I don't even know if God is here. Have I been abandoned? You ever been there before? You ever felt that? One of the things that we see in Scripture oftentimes is that it's the desert that God uses to increase our intimacy with Him, to help us grow in our faith and trust in Him. Perhaps the greatest example of this in all of Scripture is the Old Testament prophet Hosea. He, he probably shows this best of all. God leads Hosea out into the desert, right? Makes him completely, 100%, absolutely and totally dependent upon God's provision. And in that struggle and in that challenging time, Hosea finds a new found and deeper appreciation and love for God. When we have a, a desert experience, we have a tendency to mistakenly think that maybe God has abandoned us, that God has forgotten about us. But hear me, God does not abandon his people. He loves you. And the one other thing I want you to hear today is that as God is refining you, he's not punishing you. It's easy to think that when things aren't going our way, right? It's easy to think, oh, God's punishing me. I mean, it's almost human nature to think that way. 
I mean, I knew I should have been doing more in my Bible study. I knew I, knew I should have been praying more. I knew I should have been reading my Bible more. I should, I, I should have had more quiet times. I knew I shouldn't have said that. I, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Now the Lord is going to get me. Right? Now the Lord's punishing me. No. Let's be straight. The Lord does discipline all that he loves. That is true. The Lord disciplines all that he loves. But the discipline of the Lord is never meant to consume us nor destroy us as his children. Discipline is intended to woo us, to reconcile us, to reset us. In fact, it's even in this text. Verse 6 of Malachi 3 says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Let me tell you why that's such a huge deal. Because that's a, an important thing. He says, I, the Lord, do not change. I mean, look, look at me here. Look at me. It means he doesn't change his mind concerning you. Because, hear this, the Bible is absolutely clear that God saved you when you were at your worst. Right? While you were yet a sinner. Before you even knew you needed to be saved, God was already at work saving you. So God has seen you at your worst. It wasn't like you said, oh, let me, let me get all cleaned up, showered up, do my hair so I look good for God, and then we'll be in relationship, right? How many of you got to clean yourself up before God plucked you out of your sin? Nobody. None of us. We were confused, we were battered, we were beaten, we were broken, we were enslaved, we were spiritually sick. And the Bible says that while we were living in that muck, the muck, the mire, the God of the Bible took his pure and his holy hands, he reached down into that mud, into that spiritual filth, into that mess. God in his perfectness reached into our mess and pulled us out and put a new song in our mouths. And ever since then, God has been wiping us off. He's been dusting us off. He's been cleaning us off and getting rid of that filth. And God does not change and he has not changed his mind about you. God doesn't look at us and go, eh, I need a mulligan on that guy. Right? Oh, I should have just left him there. That was a mistake. Whew. Got that one wrong, huh? What do you think, Jesus? God doesn't do that, right? The always has been, always will be, forever God is intimately acquainted with us, with our good and with our bad. The God who lives outside of time, who's seen all of our days, who knows the end of the story, who's written the end of the story. The God who knows the next time you're about to train wreck your life. The God who knows how next week you're going to sin. That very God still looks at you and loves you despite our brokenness. Listen, Christian, our day of judgment, our day of judgment has already happened. That's happened. And now, yeah, we're going to get to stand in front of God and we're going to give an account for all that we've done. But when, when God opens that file, right, when he pulls out the Chris Myros file and he flips that open, all he's going to see is the blood of Jesus. He's not going to see all my failures all my sins. It's going to be dripping with the blood of Christ. And I will be deemed, and you will be deemed as spotless and holy in his sight. Not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done. What has been done for you. Just because God is maybe refining you. Maybe God has taken something out of your hands. Maybe you've been disciplined Maybe you've perceived that. You feel like, oh, God just isn't close to me now. 
that doesn't mean he has abandoned you. It usually means he's refining you. Are you tracking with me? And so if God is refining you now or maybe in the future, my encouragement to you is this. As God refines you, surrender to the process. If God is a refining fire and he's trying to change something in your life, holding on to that thing tightly, trying to keep it from change, that's not going to go well for you. That's a way, that's a path to pain and suffering, in fact. God is smarter than you. God is smarter than me, I know that. And because God is for us and because God is not against us, because God loves us, he's going to break us if we try to hold on to that. God's love for us is so deep. God's love for us is so wide and so perfect that he is unwilling to leave us as we are. God knows who he has created you and me to be. And he's working to get us to move in that direction. And sometimes, sometimes that feels like the gentle breath of the Holy Spirit, right? And we change, and that's beautiful. But other times, we feel like we're in the crucible, in the refiner's fire. But regardless of what we are experiencing, hear me on this. God is at work in the mess. He loves you. He is for you. That's why he sent his son to die for you. And that's why he will send his son once again. Because God loves us. No matter what. Keep that in mind during the Christmas season. Keep in mind as we go through our struggles, as the times and the trials of our lives come, that God loves you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.